Well, um, I've been uh, I've been uh, living in my van now for uh, uh, three months, going on three months, and uh, uh, my daughter went missing in September after coming to visit her her uh, her mother in Vancouver, and uh, uh, hasn't been seen since that evening. So, and the journey here is to find my daughter, and uh, this is this is where I will remain until I find her. We just want Chelsea home. We want to know that she's okay. We want to know that, you know, she's safe. Sometimes you just don't know where to start or, you know, what to do. We miss her dearly and we just want her home and we just want her safe. Two parents, two different approaches, but the same goal. That was the family of missing person Chelsea Poorman, whose family has been doing everything they can to help find her, help raise awareness to this case. She's missing for about eight months at this point. Also, last week on May 5th, that was National Day of Awareness for missing and murdered Native women and girls. We want to raise the awareness with them. Today, let's turn on the searchlight for Chelsea Poorman. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. We've got another one to look into today. Let's get right to it. Um, we're going to mix things up a little bit and start with the Facebook page. And on Chelsea's Facebook page, we can see here, moved to Vancouver, British Columbia, July 14th, 2020. And then her final post is from September 7th, 2020. That is the day that she goes missing. It's her and her sister getting ready to go out for the evening, hitting up every club tonight on Granville, single. And that is the last post from Chelsea, but not the last time that she's heard from. We're going to get more into the details here as we go through this. If you're not familiar, Vancouver is a major city in Western Canada, located in the lower mainland region of British Columbia. As the most populous city in the province, the 2016 census recorded over 630,000 people in the city. And despite the fact that she says that she moved to Vancouver, uh, I believe she was actually living in a suburb of Vancouver called Burnaby. Um, but let's go ahead and get to the official report. This is from the Vancouver Police Department. We can see they put this report out on September 18th, 2020. Uh, we know that she went missing about 11 days before that. Um, that's going to come up as a little point of contention with the family, but uh, VPD looking for missing female. Vancouver police are asking for the public's help in locating a missing 24-year-old woman. Chelsea Poorman was last seen September 7th in Vancouver's downtown entertainment district. Um, now, also being First Nations over at aboriginalalert.ca, they have a profile on Chelsea here as well. Ms. Poorman is Indigenous, 5 feet 3 inches tall, 120 pounds, and has black hair. She was last seen wearing a gray sweater, a black crop top, black jeans, and brown boots. She was carrying a beige purse. Um, I'm curious because they're not noting an eye color in that. Let's take a look at the last one. Um, yeah, they don't have an eye color noted for her. I do think that on this Facebook page, she's she's wearing contacts here. So um, I believe it's possible that she has brown eyes, but uh, yeah, kind of strange. We don't have that piece of critical information. This picture, they, they certainly look brown. Let's continue over at BCIT News and learn a little bit more about Chelsea. Chelsea Poorman is a 24-year-old Indigenous woman from the Kawakatoos First Nation in Saskatchewan. After moving to Burnaby last year, she has been missing since September of 2020. Chelsea is described as strong, brave, and charismatic by her family and friends. Her sister, Paige Kiernan, shared her passion for art and beauty. Chelsea enjoys fashion, music, and doing her makeup, according to Kiernan. I do believe there's another sister. I think it's three girls. Um, I've And I got that from watching the episode of... Uh, Van City Van Life, which is the video that we started today's video with. And of course, I'm going to have a link to that down below. And uh, just on a personal note, I kind of like um, watching content of that nature just to see how other people are 
living in terms of getting around the country. I've been a fan of some people that go traveling that are YouTubers and kind of share their adventures and things like this. Obviously, a very different type of episode for Van City Van Life. Um, but if you've never seen that type of content, you might want to give it a little try. But outside of that, just her father's passion for what he's doing just comes through so strong. And I think this that episode would make a good companion to this episode. So I'm going to have that link in the description box down below uh, near the top. And I just want to thank Van City Van Life for sharing that. Uh, honestly, thinking about people that are traveling around the nation constantly uh, or even the continent constantly, what a good audience for reaching out to for a missing persons case. So I believe the host's name is Chrome Chrome amazing job you're doing there. Thank you so much for bringing this story onto your channel. And who knows, maybe there'll be more of that in the future where you can help with other cases. Sheila Porman, Chelsea's mother, says her daughter was trusting, kind, and had a soft spot for animals. Her kindred spirit was enjoyed by her family for over two decades before she was last seen on September 6th. Uh, that's interesting because the Facebook post does say September 7th, but I think it's showing, yeah, it's showing after midnight. That post looks like it kicked out at 1 a.m. And I think that's being regionalized possibly for my time. Um, but we, we know it's the night of the 6th going into the morning of the 7th that uh, she does disappear. And we're going to get to the details of that disappearance soon. Sheila's daughter wears a brace on her left leg and has a lifted shoe on her right foot after getting into a car accident in 2014. Her father goes into this a little bit in the Van City Life episode, and apparently it was a terrible accident. I think it involved a, a big rig or a semi truck of some kind. Um, so thankfully, she survived, but there was some serious repercussions from it. Uh, obviously wearing a brace on her leg. And also she has rods uh, in her leg and arm. So she walks with a limp and she's she can't bend her left arm. If I recall correctly, I think it's kind of at a 90 degree bend and she's not able to, to really move it beyond that. Sheila says it's hard for her to walk without her leg brace. Porman is only one of the 4,000 missing indigenous women from the past 30 years. This makes up to three women missing every week in Canada, with a quarter of cases being from British Columbia in particular. Uh, when we covered the Andrea Mizey case uh, a few months ago at this point, this also came up uh, being another indigenous disappearance and I don't want to retread all the information we did in that episode, but there is certainly some crossover in terms of, you know, this, the stats are being brought up again. Indigenous women also make up 16% of female homicide victims nationwide. And from uh, 2001 to 2014, the average rate was four times higher than female homicide victims who are non-Indigenous. Uh, we did mention in that episode that the country tried to do some analysis on the problem. You might remember Robin uh, Andrea's sister wasn't exactly thrilled with the conclusions and the information that kind of came out from the analysis and then the seeming lack of action after the analysis was complete. Um, I think I'm going to drop a link to Andrea's case uh, down below as well, just in case you're not familiar with that episode. You might want to jump into it also. So I've seen descriptions for Chelsea that mention Kawakatus, and then I've also seen Cree. And it seems like both are actually true. Uh, the Kawakatoos First Nation is a Plains Cree First Nations band government in Saskatchewan. So I guess you could almost consider it like a, an, not an offshoot, but maybe like a subsection of Cree First Nations. The First Nations is named for Chief Kawakatoos. His name derives from the Cree uh, Kawakatoso, be weak with hunger. Although Hungry Skinny Man is a more accurate translation, but get this, Chelsea's last name, Poor Man, has also been used historically and is still the official name of the Poor Man 88 Reserve. Uh, and I did notice Chelsea's Facebook page, at least this one, she did have several. Uh, her last name is actually listed as Kiernan on this. Uh, I do believe that Mike, her father from the opening clip, uh, I believe that he adopted the daughters. So that is uh, his last name. Uh, so it seems like she had kind of used both in her life. 
And just to kind of wrap up this aspect of the conversation, the Cree are one of the largest groups of First Nations in North America and Canada. Over 350,000 people are Cree or have Cree ancestry. Uh, let's go ahead and continue. What happened? What happened with this disappearance? And let me ask another question before we even get into that. Here we see the first post from September 18th, 2020. Uh, you know, obviously almost two weeks after she went missing. We don't have a date on this Aboriginal alert, but there is practically no media on this case. And then all of a sudden, Christmas Eve of 2020 is uh, at least the first trace of media that I can find on this from cbc.ca. This picture, I believe, might be from the night that they were going out. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm wondering if that's a match for... Or maybe it's the same session of them getting ready, going out for the evening. Let's see. She seems to have a like a charm on her cheek here. Yeah, I can't really make it out on this one. This could be later in the night. Who knows? This could be them, you know, using the restaurant at the bar they went to or something. Uh, Chelsea Poorman was last seen in the Granville Street area in downtown Vancouver. Of course, this being Christmas Eve when this came out, um, they're interviewing her sister for this article. It doesn't feel like Christmas, said her sister, Paige Kiernan. I just feel like I can't really do anything, can't celebrate things when I don't know where my sister is. I don't know if she's okay. The sisters were having dinner and drinks on Granville Street the night of September 6th, Kiernan said. They went to visit a friend at an apartment at Granville and Davie afterward. At around midnight, Horman left and didn't tell anyone where she was going or who she was going to meet, Kiernan said. The sisters spoke by phone after. She's just like, leave me alone. I'm with my new bae, Kiernan said. And I was like, Chelsea, who's there? Where are you? And she still didn't say anything and hung up on me. There have been no signs of her since. No indication her phone was used for any other calls or texts and no sightings. Poorman has since turned 25 years old. It's unusual for her to not be in contact with her family or active on social media, Kiernan said. Um, with that comes a really big question. We know that she has her phone and she says she's with her bae. Are they at their final destination? We don't know, but... Is there potentially some types of some type of GPS or ping information that law enforcement can get about where she was during that actual phone call? There certainly should be. Do they have that information? I don't know. Is that information helpful to them? I don't know. Because if it does drill down to GPS, that could be a very strong indicator. But if they're at a public place, like they went off to another bar or something, uh, that could potentially be helpful. Maybe cameras at that location might have captured them, something along those lines. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other places they could be where maybe that information wouldn't be so helpful. And then, of course, if it's not GPS level information, but more ping data, um, just the, the size of the area widens and it becomes a little less helpful. But I'd be really curious to know um, what's going on with that phone information. We are going to hear a little bit about it, but not really the fine details that I was hoping for in terms of trying to uh, help investigators on this front by pinpointing a, a, a spot or a, a place in time where citizens might have been and might have memories or recall something that's going on at that particular place in time. In an email, Sergeant Steve Addison said Poorman's case has been transferred to the homicide section and being and is being treated as a missing persons case that requires additional resources. It's not currently being considered a homicide, he clarified. Chelsea is vulnerable, and her disappearance is higher risk for a variety of socioeconomic factors. As such, a more robust investigation is required to determine the circumstances surrounding her disappearance and to hopefully locate her safe and sound, Addison said. I'm, in one way, I'm kind of thankful that it sounds like uh, her ancestry, unfortunately, I mean, it's a terrible way to think about this, but it is an elevated risk factor for what's going on to her and or going on with her and they're recognizing that and they're kind of wrapping that into their formula of how many resources they need to allocate for a case like this in terms of chelsea being vulnerable uh we know she's got some physical ailments but i'm also seeing mentioned in a few articles that um, there might have been some mental impairment that happened as a result of the accident as well so we've got 
many different kind of factors going on here. Kind of scary in one way that a homicide department's handling this case, but based on what Sergeant Addison is saying here, um, it seems like it's specifically for those additional resources. And I really hope that that's the truth of the situation. Of course, you know, here we are almost eight, nine months later, uh, and we still don't know where Chelsea is. Uh, her left arm has faded tattoos. Now, I've gone looking for some photos uh, of her tattoos, and I haven't had a whole lot of luck. Uh, in this photo here that is with her mother, um, I'm seeing some marks on her arms, but I don't know if those are faded tattoos or scars, possibly, from the injuries that she sustained. However, there is this picture, uh, and we've got a considerable tattoo uh, right across her clavicle. And I've got a little bit of a bigger photo we could take a look at. Here you go. I can't really make out what it says necessarily, um, but pretty substantial in terms of size. I do want to point out on some of her social media, there's some pictures where it looks like it's either faded out or maybe she's trying to cover it up with makeup or something along those lines. So I don't know that it's as strong as we see here in this photo. Um, but that's about all I could find for tattoos. And of course, with the profiles, they really didn't mention any at all. Portman was planning to attend film school. She is super funny, always trying to make people laugh. Very sweet person, very polite. She's a little bit soft-spoken, said her sister. So um, really tough details in terms of how she goes missing. There's just not a whole lot. How do you process that? She's out with her sister. Uh, here is Vancouver. Let's take a look at the bar they went to. So here we're zooming in on Hotel Belmont. This is where they went, uh, had some drinks, and then just a little bit down the same street, like literally looks like just about three blocks is the apartment that they went to visit. And it was three blocks down and kind of across the street. And this is the apartment that they were at, hanging out with friends. And at some point, Chelsea decides she's going to leave. I've got a little more from her father here. Let's hear his explanation of what's going on around her leaving that apartment building. They were in apartments on the fourth floor. And Chelsea came down from there. And that's the last known location of Chelsea Parma. Now, we're talking kind of downtown metropolitan area. We've got businesses all over the place. Um, not on this block in particular. It looks like it starts thinning out a little bit. I mean, we've got a 7-Eleven down here. There's a pharmacy. There's some stores. Um, but back closer to where they were having drinks earlier, you can see it, it gets busier and busier. There's more restaurants, more bars. There's even a bank. So kind of depending on what direction she walked off in, um, I'm wondering about the possibility that she was caught on camera somewhere, but that's where we start talking about that time gap, that time gap that seems to show up when police uh, put out the initial posting about her disappearance and that being 11, 12 days after she actually disappeared. Was that enough of a period of time that some of those security cameras had already overwritten themselves or dropped the information that might be helpful? Um, I don't know, but when you're looking at a street like this, uh, cameras are just all over my mind. I actually earlier today just did the little virtual walk, zoomed in on certain places, and you've got, I mean, you've got like a Ramada uh, hotel here. You've got all these businesses where you know they're going to have concerns of, not, not like major concerns of safety, but they're going to have reasonable security measures for businesses of that nature, especially a bank or a hotel like that. They've got to have cameras that are pointing out here. And I did notice several cameras in my kind of earlier virtual walk that I could zoom in on. I don't know if they're working or not, or if they're just there to kind of scare, scare off, you know, potential criminal activity. But I saw several instances. Um, so that's kind of another big question right now. I'm wondering about that cell phone information. I'm wondering about cameras. Uh, we've looked at many other cases where effectively there is a trace of the person's movements that they're able to make using the cameras from the place that they were last known. And we know based off the information that Chelsea's father just gave us, it's that apartment building 
So what happens when she hits the door? Even just knowing one ping of the camera data would tell us what direction she went down this street. That could be helpful in itself. So I'm just really curious why some of that information isn't really coming forward, isn't being released to the press. I don't think saying she came out the front door of the apartments and then she went left down the street, down Belmont Street. I can't imagine that that would be too risky to any type of prosecution proceedings or charges being filed or anything like that. And I do think it, it seems like it should be reasonable, reasonably helpful in some way for at least people that live in the area to say, oh yeah, I was down. I was in that block at that time. Um, but we don't know. The other thing that kind of grabs me about this location, do you notice on the right, we got a police car here. We got a police car here. We got a police car here. Um, that's not because there's some crime that's happening here. There's an actual office for a community policing center right here, Granville Community Policing Center. Um, wouldn't they have a camera possibly that could pick up what's going on across the street just to know which way she's going would already be some type of help on this case. Um, so I'm just, I'm really curious why we're not hearing that 7-Eleven. I have to bet 7-Eleven has a camera. They, between the 7-Eleven and the community policing center, they have to know which direction she went down the street. Could it be helpful? Possibly. Obviously it's not a 100% thing, but I'm just surprised we don't even have just a general direction of where she might've gone. And then, you know, if you got the camera traces happening like that, you might be able to find out where she meets up with someone and then maybe get a little video clip of what that person looks like, what they're wearing. Uh, that's another thing about the cell phone that's kind of kicking around in my brain. Did, did she, if she's going to meet up with someone, she had to be communicating with them in some way to line up that time. Is it someone that she had met earlier back at the bar that they were at earlier in the evening? Um, we know the sister doesn't know that information, but if they're not finding any trace on her phone of her communicating with someone to arrange for this meetup, I would have to assume that she spoke to them possibly in person earlier that night and said, oh, by the way, hey, I'll meet you at uh, 1230 over at this bar or at this particular address or something like that. So um, just another consideration there. Over at the tie.ca, we see um, just a huge march for the violence against women. Chelsea Portman's mom uh, is over here on the right and her sister Paige is here on the left. You can see they're both holding signs for Chelsea. And this is the annual Women's Memorial March in the downtown east side. This one was held February 14th, 2021. This is the 30th year indigenous families and supporters have gathered in the downtown east side to remember the women and girls who have died or gone missing. The march comes after a particularly deadly year for women in the downtown east side. Organizer Myrna Cranmer told the Thai she had a list of 50 women who had died in the past year. The Memorial March has always drawn attention to the disproportionate numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women, and organizers say it was more important than ever to hold the march this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed deadly inequalities across Canadian society with violence against women, fatal overdoses, and racist incidents all increasing. And I just want to share some of these photos with you because I'm like conflicted about what I see. I'm seeing a beautiful photograph like this. I'm seeing people proud with their traditions and showing their heritage, but you know they're having to do this march to draw attention to a significant problem that's going on. And it's just, there's so much pride, but it's heartbreaking for me to know the event that's, that's bringing all of this out. Um, Sheila Porman and her daughter, Paige Kiernan, were marching with posters that showed photographs of Porman's daughter, Chelsea. Chelsea lived in the downtown east side and was last seen in the first week of September. Porman has been searching for her ever since. We're here to support the other families who also have loved ones missing or have passed on, said Porman. And there's another shot of her sister carrying a sign for her. 
Family searches for clues months after 24-year-old Cree woman vanishes in downtown Vancouver. And you recognize this woman. There is Chelsea's mother at work putting up the posters. Sheila Poorman has spent six months taping posters up across Vancouver, hoping someone might know why her daughter vanished after leaving a downtown apartment. She wonders how no one could have noticed Chelsea Poorman, a 24-year-old Cree woman with round cheeks, friendly, brown eyes, Thankfully, I think we just got the confirmation. And a noticeable limp. Leave an apartment at Granville and Davie Streets around midnight on September 6th when those streets are lined with closed-circuit video cameras. She says neither her family nor police have any substantial leads as to the identity of the man or what happened next. The unanswered questions have been agonizing. Quote, her sisters, myself, we miss her dearly, and we just want her home, and we just want her safe, she said. The family has hired a private investigator. Poorman continues to search for her daughter herself because she worries police did not act quickly enough at the time of her disappearance. Poorman says she was disappointed that they did not issue a public missing persons notice until 10 days later. When asked this week whether the case is considered a homicide, police said they had no updates, but that detectives are still working on it. So that's kind of interesting. That sounds like a little bit of a position change from the earlier articles. But of course, here we are six months later, um, and it sounds like they just didn't want to answer that question directly. No updates. Detectives still working on it. Lorelai Williams, a former woman's coordinator at the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center Society, is working with Poorman to organize a vigil walk on March 19th. VACPC exists to address social justice issues and build a better relationship between the Indigenous community and the police. Quote, they, families of missing women, feel like the police aren't doing enough and they don't know what else to do, she said. I find that it's families and their supporters that are always doing the groundwork. They're always searching because that's their missing loved one. And obviously, both her parents, like I mentioned at the start of this episode, using different methods. Uh, her father seemed to actually start his rallying campaign on that particular street. But at some point, how many flyers do you hand out? How many doors do you knock on? Uh, how many post-its do you leave, as, as he put it, before you kind of run out of options there? And you really don't know where the person is that has the information that can help you. It could have been someone that was visiting the downtown area that doesn't actually live down there. They were down there for drinks and dinner or something that has the the key that you're looking for. So, um, you know, for him to decide that he's going to get in the van, he's going to go all over Western Canada trying to raise awareness to this case uh, makes a lot of sense. But also, once again, if you check out that Van City Van Life episode, um, there's something about it emotionally for him that's helping. He says that he doesn't think he'd even be able to sleep at home at this point. I think he needs that feeling that he knows he's taking steps to help the case. And for him, those steps are raising awareness um, with, with doing that trip. So in June, a CBC News survey found that there is still no uniform or coordinated approach among police forces handling cases of missing or murdered Indigenous women in Canada a year after a national inquiry into the issue was completed. Um, and that's, I mean, just look at what's happening in this case in particular. Maybe it would be good to standardize the practice of if we have a person that goes missing, we need more resources on it for indigenous women in particular and automatically transfer it to a homicide division so that the additional resources are immediately assigned. Like we're seeing an example, even in this case of something that could be a good kind of proactive step in terms of the investigation that maybe would help other cases in the country as well. And that's one of the things that gets a little frustrating when you're hearing that, you know, they're doing this analysis they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on with this particular issue. And then you've got all these pockets that are working independently kind of in different ways. Some of them have some great best pr practices. Other areas might not be aware of those. And those good ideas just don't get transferred over. And those cases don't get handled the same. So um, I think they're raising a really, really good point here. Williams says she's frustrated that no video recordings have been released that might help find Chelsea. 
And I think that's just fair. I mean, just based off of the many investigations that we've looked into, that we've reviewed here on the channel and how they've been conducted, um, there's something about getting a piece of tape out there that the media just jumps on. If they had a little two second clip of Chelsea walking down a street, that's all it would take for another major round of media to spin up around this case. And then outside of that, if it is some helpful information, like we were talking about direction that she's going in business that she's showing up at a uh, person walking with her, something along those lines, it could even be stronger in terms of helping the investigation. Um, I'll tell you guys, I'm seeing some marks on her here, and I'm wondering if um, I'm wondering if she got tattoo removal. I did see someone comment on one of the Facebook pages, and they were kind of asking, "Are are you getting tattoo removal?" Um, I'm kind of wondering that because I'm seeing some marks here that do kind of look like they could be related to tattoo removal. Um, maybe that's why we're not seeing any strong description of her tattoos when it comes to the missing persons information. Uh, over at the Star, this is actually a reprint of an article from the TIE. Uh, on a warm September day, Chelsea Poorman traveled from her home in Burnaby to visit her mom and sister in Vancouver. They planned to go for dinner, but at the last minute, Chelsea's mom decided not to go. I thought they'll probably have more fun without me, Sheila told the TIE. Uh, so I just let them go and have sister time. I was trying to keep in contact with both of them and then page phoned said Sheila, who works as a support worker with Luma Native Housing Society. She said she didn't know where Chelsea was. Chelsea had gone missing before. The 24-year-old woman had moved from Regina to Burnaby in July and was living with her boyfriend with plans of going back to school. But shortly after Chelsea arrived in the city, Sheila and Paige weren't able to reach her for five days. They reported her missing. So this might be giving us some context and i would i would hate to think that law enforcement would respond in this way but it's possible she was reported missing uh just a few months before she goes missing again and she's missing for five days at that point and then she just kind of turns back up i don't know if that impacted them responding to it personally i don't think it should um but it, it might have uh, so they couldn't reach her for five days. They reported her missing, but then Chelsea got back in touch with Sheila. She told her that she'd lost her phone and she hadn't been able to reach them. When Chelsea went missing for a second time, Sheila had a feeling that this time it was different. The last time Sheila and Paige saw Chelsea was September 6th. On September 8th, Sheila contacted the Vancouver Police Department to report Chelsea missing. Quote, they just didn't seem like they were too interested in looking for Chelsea. At one point, the officers told my one daughter that they had more important things to do. But once the homicide unit took over, they seemed to have more resources. So they're out there taking it more seriously. And I have to say, Chelsea's father is very strong in the YouTube video. Um, several times he's driving the point of he believes law enforcement is doing their best with the case. He knows people that are working in law enforcement, their parents also, they they know what it means to love someone. And if that person goes missing, what that would do to them. Um, so he seems to be uh, in, in a pretty good place in terms of his belief with law enforcement's efforts around this. To date, police have taken numerous investigative steps, including interviewing several people associated with Ms. Poorman, uh, reviewing relevant banking and cell phone records. So we're hearing from them. They are reviewing the cell phone records, conducting an extensive video canvas and collaborating with Saskatoon police. Dale Weedman, an inspector with the VPD's major crime section, wrote to them in an email. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's the basics of what we've been talking about on this episode. They're saying they did effectively go out looking for video obviously the time frame on that is substantial i mean if they go looking for that video three weeks after the fact are there some cameras that maybe will would still have information at that point possibly if they've got like a 30-day loop on them or something or if it's just memory based and the memory hasn't filled up at that point um Cell phone records, I think that's an obvious one. Banking information, that's another thing. We're not hearing the kind of standard statement of, you know, she hasn't used her cards. She hasn't pulled any money from the bank. Um, I don't know. I just, I really feel like 
There's a little bit of a piece missing in terms of helpful information coming out from law enforcement um, that could just help pop this case just a little more in terms of the media's attention. This investigation remains very active. However, in order to protect the integrity of ongoing measures, I'm unable to elaborate further. Um, we get another quote down here from her mother. I hope she's okay and that she's coming home soon. Every day I think she's going to come home. Somebody's going to find her. Or if someone has her, that she'll escape. Sheila is asking Vancouver residents to look for Chelsea. I would just like people, when they're out doing their daily activities, running errands, on their way to work, just to keep an eye out for Chelsea, she said. Over at VancouverIsAwesome.com, we see the plans for the vigil kind of firming up. Uh, with the support of Butterflies and Spirit, the family of Chelsea Poorman is organizing the vigil walk to raise awareness about her disappearance. Participants are asked to wear red to symbolize their unity with the family and to honor all missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And here we've got just a little bit of video to run uh, showing the vigil here. We've got a few hundred people getting together. They wind up shutting down the street. You can see they're, they're holding it in the actual intersection. And then uh, from there, they have speeches and they do go walking down to where she went missing. We don't want her to be forgotten, said Chelsea's mom, Sheila. We want her name to be remembered. We want her face to be remembered. Somebody knows something out there. Somebody knows where my daughter is. Uh, for the Poorman family, it's been a grueling seven months wondering what happened to her. Every day they walk the streets, handing out business cards with her missing poster on it. The family says as soon as they put up a poster, someone takes them down shortly after. We hear about that in these cases a lot, and I don't know what that's about. I don't know if it's people like, is it business owners taking them from their windows? Is it people that are upset? They think that it's cluttering up their street or something. I mean, of course, in many of these cases, people are thinking it's someone acting, uh, someone that's being nefarious, that they're going because they're trying to hide the truth of that case. But you can see on these blocks, they're also posting digital billboards that actually light up with information about her as well. Um, I just, I don't know why we hear about that so often in cases. The family led the way down Granville Street, passing by six bus stops that feature Chelsea Poorman's missing poster on digital screens that light up at night. Then a candlelight vigil was held at Victory Square featuring Cree singers and jingle dress dancers. Chelsea's face was illuminated on the glass candle holders. For Sheila Poorman, she was overcome with emotion seeing all the support. And in April, the information comes out about a father that moves into his van to search Western Canada. A Vancouver father desperate to find his missing daughter has been living in his van and driving around Western Canada for the past three months trying to find her. Michael Kiernan says he couldn't sit back and wait for her to be found any longer. So for the past three months, he's driven from Saskatchewan to Alberta and back to BC handing out flyers and asking people if they've seen Poorman. Uh, we love her so much, and she is so missed, he says. I'd be going crazy anywhere else. I know I just can't focus on anything else but this. If I watched the police knocking on every single door, I'd probably be like, hey, did you leave a flyer? Did you leave a post-it note? I don't know if it would ever be enough, he said. Uh, Kiernan says he keeps visiting the same places in Vancouver, trying to convince businesses to post the flyers he's made. Quote, there's a lot of places that don't even put up posters. That's so, so discouraging, he says, adding that he hopes that people will do what they can to help find his daughter. Please help spread the word. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your coworkers. Everybody. Awareness is so key. He's absolutely right. And at this point, I'm going to ask if you have friends in Western Canada, please share this video with them. Let's make sure that they know about Chelsea's case and make sure that they're keeping their eyes, ears, and hearts open for her as well. He wants people to understand that his daughter is more than just a face on a poster, that she is loved and missed. She's kind. She's curious. She's polite. She does have her issues with addiction and alcohol, but through it all, through everything this kid has been through, she has pulled through time and time again, and she's got so much strength. She's always been a beautiful kid, he says. 
words of a loving father. And ChelseaPorman.com is the website that is written on the side of his van. And here it is. Um, what he really wants people to do is to come to ChelseaPorman.com and this top one here, see how it changes? Uh, if you click on it, it'll actually turn into a download of the poster. He's asking for people that live in the area, please just make your own copy of the poster and put it up somewhere. Um, and we can see, I think it looks like he's formatting this uh, on a cell phone probably, but he's also got videos, pictures, um, different press that he's done here and a photo of him outside the van traveling. Uh, he is also running a GoFundMe for travel expenses. Looks like he's been trying to raise about a $5,000 goal. He's currently at $3,230. On behalf of myself and my amazing supporters, we want to make sure that Mike can keep this trip going for as long as he needs to. We're making a donation to this GoFundMe just as soon as I'm done filming today's episode. And what about the mother? The mother of a missing daughter is still seeking answers. This is the latest article from May 11th, 2021. Sheila Porman has been searching for her 25-year-old daughter, Chelsea, for nine months now. The Vancouver Island woman says she won't give up the search for her daughter. I'm not giving up hope. I know she's still out there. To date, the family has raised $10,000 as a reward for any information that leads to the young woman's whereabouts. So there is a reward available on this case as well. If you have information about this case, we've got the contact details that you need in the description box down below. Uh, I also did find the Twitter for Paige, and we can see one of the most recent posts there is from May 4th, and it is a 30-second montage about their search and their love for Chelsea. So I'll have a link to Paige's Twitter account also down below. Where is Chelsea Poorman? Um, this is a case that really boils down to who she with when she was talking to her sister. Where were they when that conversation happened? And where did things go from there? Um, and to really kind of help with that, we're looking for people that were in the area at the time, might have noticed a, a, a young girl walking with a limp, uh, wearing a gray sweater over black clothing. Um, this case just, it needs help. It's, it's got that missing piece factor and I kind of see it from two angles. There's the missing piece of a witness that has the information that can help, but I also feel like there's a missing piece in terms of the forensic information that might be more helpful if it's put out into the public. And I do hope at some point that Vancouver PD starts putting out just some press releases that it doesn't have to be information that's going to compromise the investigation. Just the simple basics of what direction did she go walking out of? Was she spotted by any businesses further down either side of that street? I think that would just be a huge first step to at least trying to localize um, or, or, or help focus in on the search area. Who knows? Maybe that gets Mike back to that particular area and he knows, oh, she's spotted on this other street five blocks over. You know, I didn't do my door to door knock process on that street. I got to get back there and do that. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like there's a few different ways that this case can be helped. And I'm hoping that someone out there that's watching this video, I hope you're the person that has that piece and that you can find it within your heart to pick up the phone. There is the number for VPD down below, but there's also a number for Crime Stoppers. If you need to remain anonymous, call the Crime Stoppers number. They will absolutely help you do that. You'll still be qualified for the reward. Uh, they basically give you a randomized number. You call back after the case has been solved. You give them the number. They confirm that your tip is the thing that helped break it, and you get the reward. So please do the right thing and pick up that phone. Um, I have to thank my supporters. We can't do all the donations. We've been doing so many donations lately, and it's because of you guys. Thank you so much. A big thank you to new patrons, Jill Durocher, uh, Carly Surgener, and thank you to Leslie Ann Davis and Charleston and Amy for increasing your pledges. If you'd like to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even buy us a coffee like Don Counts recently did. We really appreciate you being part of our team and helping us help these families in these terrible situations. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. I'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord Narch channel. 